Good morning, everyone. It's great to see everyone in the house of the Lord this morning. We do want to welcome those that are joining us online. It's so good that we can join together, and I do truly believe that God has things in store for us, that we're going to leave this place today changed. If you're willing and able, let's just stand and uh, have a word of prayer and get ready to open our hearts in praise and worship to the Lord. God, we come to you this morning, and we thank you that you are present in this place. Lord, we thank you that you are always here, and that when we come here together on Sunday, when we join together and worship you, it brings you honor, it brings you glory, it brings you joy. And God, that's what we want to do this morning. We want our hearts to be open and receptive to what you're doing, Lord. We know that you have a plan, we know that you have a purpose, and we know that you have good things in store. And Lord, we thank you that even though the world seems dark at times and there may be hardships, we're thankful that we have a hope that comes from you, that our foundation is in you, Lord, and that we can have joy because we know that our hope is found in you. God, as we enter into this service this morning, we ask that every word that is spoken and every song that is sung brings honor and glory to you, Lord, because you are so deserving of it. We thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die on our behalf, that you saw us at our lowest, you saw us in the deepest and darkness of our sin, but you made a way. You said, I will go in their place and I will be the sacrifice for them. And we are so thankful for that, Lord. We're thankful that we can stand here this morning with hearts open, hearts on fire for you this morning. And we just ask that you have your way here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
So that was absolutely perfect. Did you see how the words were not what they should have been? Did you see the confusion level that's there? This is what's really cool. Today, I'm not doing a Bible story. I am preaching on the Word of God. And like one of the first lines in my sermon is, words are important. And that's why we planned that that way. <laughs> it just worked out great, didn't it? Donna's like, why isn't this working? I said, I don't know, and I panicked, but yeah. Whenever he plans that, I wish you would tell me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was lying, right? I didn't really plan it that way. Uh, that's great. Hey, we're glad that you're here today. My name's Steve. I'm the pastor at Kerbinsville Alliance. Thanks for joining us online if you happen to be here as well. I want to cover some family life news. I'm going to ask Eric if he'll come right now. And he's going to talk about one of our first announcements. It has to do with young guns. I'm not sure what kind of church this is that we have. Go ahead. You can talk about it. And well, come on over here pretty close. Young to guns. Point. I mean, look at it. That's right. You and me, right? <laughs> okay, you, not me. All right. Hey, so we're starting a new Sunday school class. It's uh, 78 weeks. Tim Smay, stop it. <laughs> Say 78 weeks? Seven to eight weeks. Yeah. yeah, I can't hold attention for 78 weeks. Uh, seven to eight weeks Sunday school uh, class at 9.30 starting next week. It's for ages, uh, let me make sure I get this right. If you're graduating from high school next year, so if you just finished 11th grade, you're in 12th grade next year, and you're 25 or under, this means you. Um, so what this is about is it's based on a book by, by Dennis Rainey called Stepping Up, A Call to Courageous Manhood. And I'm going to read just a real quick paragraph here. Rainey identifies five stages of man's journey through life, boyhood, adolescence, manhood, mentor, and patriarch, and examines a man's responsibility at each step. He calls all men to action, to duty, to courage. And where this came from at 50 plus years old, I look back at that time in my life and I think, man, I knew what I was doing. Now, I didn't. Uh, I thought I did. I really did. And I based my decisions on what I thought at the time. And I wish that I had had something like this in my brain that I could work off of. This is a biblical perspective of, of the reaction of what she, we should expect and how we should act in life and step up to be the man that God wants you to be. And that's what this is about. It's not about Eric, it's about this book and about what God is calling you to be. So I hope if you're in that age group, if you're a guy and you wanna join me, we're gonna be in room 206 starting next week at 9.30 in the morning. Maybe we'll have some treats. We'll see what uh, Mrs. Rolls has to say about that. <laughs> but thanks for your time. Give me a, a, a call or, or hit me up in the in the lobby if you want to talk about it. Thanks. That's great, Eric. And that is a fantastic book. I would say to you, if you're in that age group, what is it, grade 12 through age 25, uh, a guy in that age group, and, and you don't jump on this, you're really just missing something really good. And it will help you to live, here's the word I'm thinking of, effectively. Your life will make a difference. And believe it or not, that's what you deep down hunger for. All right? Hey, a couple other things to be talking about. There's a blood drive coming up on the 13th of July here at the church. You can sign up uh, on the activity center, or on the bulletin board near the activity center. Or you can, no, 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 no. Let me start over. Good morning. My name's Steve Shields. There's a blood drive in mid-July. There's a sign-up sheet for people that can help with that on the bulletin board near the elevator. If you would like to give blood, you can give blood at redcross.org or by calling the number for the Red Cross that is here, and they'll be glad to schedule you an appointment. Uh, so be aware of that blood drive that's coming up. The rest of these announcements are repeat announcements, but I'll mention them very briefly. Don't forget about International Workers' Day and bringing supplies for the IWs. Don't forget about uh, Operation Christmas Child and the items you can bring there. Don't forget about Ukraine, be in prayer for them and ways that you might be able to help as well. And we need children's workers. Uh, if you can help with that, uh, you can speak to Autumn or uh, you can speak to Laurel. Laurel, was there something more that you had in mind? Did I hear you cough? Did you hear her cough? Did I hear you cough over there, darling? Yeah. What's is something in your throat? Cool. Specifically, what we need are children's worship workers. Um, and that is for a month at a time. And we need them for the rest of the year. Um, we're almost into July, and we don't have workers for, for the remainder of the year. So look at the sheet. That is on the Children's Ministries Bulletin Board. 
and we need a teacher and a helper for each month. That goes a month at a time, all the materials are supplied. It is not difficult, you'll get it ahead of time so you can prepare. Um, it's really fun upstairs with the kids, you really get to know them. So I would encourage you to do that if you're interested, you do need clearances. Right, and Bethany can help you with the clearances. I have these grandkids, they're coming on Friday, and I love them, and I love their Grandma Shields. She is so cool, such, such a help. That's her right there. So thank you, Laurel. I really appreciate you helping me out with that. Those are the announcements I'm going to cover today. I do want to mention just some things we're praying for today. And uh, one of those things is please be praying for the family of Diane Decker. I see uh, that most of them are here right now. Uh, she passed away yesterday. If you're on the e-prayer line, you got that information. And uh, just be praying for them during this week. Um, she, uh, of course, was struggling with dementia, and uh, that was such a difficult journey they've been on. And uh, just pray that God will give them a sense of peace and comfort during this time, and that they would know the peace that passes understanding uh, as well. And their daughter, Rachel, is headed to Ecuador, leaving tomorrow, I believe. Uh, is that correct, Bo? Tomorrow? Yeah. Taking her to Pittsburgh today, right? So she's with us this morning, and we're going to pray for her in just a few minutes as she prepares to go. I do want to mention as well, uh, to be, ask you as well to be praying for expectant parents um, in our congregation. Uh, those who are adopting include the Caldwells and the Dobbs, and then of course those who are expecting are Preston and Riley and uh, Kyle and Brandy and Brandon and Cassidy. Uh, be praying for them if you would. Uh, pray for Jay Schlegel. He's dealing with shingles and recovering from those. I spoke to him this week and he's coming along. Uh, pray also if you would uh, just... Uh, for our international workers, I met with Tom and Lois this week, and they have the car. Our church uh, covered the expense of that car for them, and we're planning to do the same for the Hudsons. That's such a blessing to them when they come home, saved, literally saved them, and saved the kingdom thousands of dollars because we have connections. We were able to get uh, $150 a month to rent a car for an international worker. That's such a blessing. And so uh, be praying uh, for uh, the Fords as they're traveling from church to church. Also, Lois has seen her um, mom uh, in Tennessee. Uh, her mom is aged and broke her hip uh, recently. She's in her 90s, and so she's kind of at risk right now. Uh, just pray that Lois has a fulfilling visit. It'll be fulfilling both to mom and to Lois, and uh, then pray for them as they travel around. And second, pray for the Hudsons as they be traveling around doing this uh, similar thing, speaking at different churches. Um, that'll be great to have them here. Hudsons are going to be speaking. Do you happen to remember when they're speaking? I don't either. It's in a week or two. I'll, I'll make sure I have it uh, in the, on my blog so you're aware of it and put it on an email prayer list too. And then uh, the Fords are speaking the last week in July here at Kermansville Alliance. Okay. In just a moment, I've asked Jess Thatchick if she would pray for Rachel. So she'll do that in just a moment. But before she does that, I want to just introduce to you one of my really good friends. Um, Myrtle, would you stand up? And you can too if you would, Amy Lane. The two of you stand up. Okay. So this is Myrtle Zorger and Amy Lane, and Myrtle is the oldest member at Kerbinsville Alliance. She's visiting from Georgia, so we're so glad that she's here today. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Myrtle is, uh, you know, a pastor should never have favorites. I'll stop now. She's one of, she is my favorite, and I'm so glad that she's here. Um, just a blessing to see her. So we're going to unite our hearts to pray um, for Rachel here. And I want to just share with you, um, she asked us to pray specifically about three different things. Um, number one, and, and there's really four things here. Number one, her three flights on Monday, that they would connect smoothly and she would travel safely. And so that's a pretty big journey she's taking. And if she's got three flights, that makes it all the more complex. So that's number one. Number two, and I love Rachel's heart. Listen to these words. Pray that I would be a blessing to the ministry and the missionaries I'm staying with. That's cool, isn't it? She has a heart to serve. Number three, pray that I would have eyes to see how the Lord is moving in Ecuador and in my own life. Isn't that beautiful? And a fourth request we would add would be pray for her family. Having scheduled this in advance, she's not going to be at the funeral service. Uh, pray for her regarding that. Pray for all of the family regarding this. We rejoice in Diane's life. It was a wonderful life, you know? And we rejoice in the exemplary care 
that her husband and the family gave her here in these last years. And we rejoice in Jesus that as her faith was in Christ, the dementia is gone. <laughs> There's no more suffering, no more pain. We're, I, I'm actually going to have a Bible verse on the screen this morning that says, he will wipe every tear away. And I just imagine Jesus greeting her and saying, no more tears. Rejoice in my presence. And I'm sure she's doing that. That doesn't mean we won't miss her. We will miss her and we will grieve, but not as those who have no hope. So uh, pray for that family. Um, Jess, I ask you if you would pray for Rachel. Could you do that at this time, please? Let's bow our hearts together. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for Rachel. Lord, what a privilege that... The last few years, we got to know her. I mean, you could have sent her to any church, and you chose us. And so it's our responsibility now to lift her to you in prayer today, uh, before she travels to Ecuador, and to remember her daily um, for this next month, for this next six weeks. And um, so first, I just pray for us as a congregation to to just remember every day when we wake up to pray for Rachel, to pray for her family. And right now I just pray for uh, the specific requests that she asked. We think of those flights. We think of the running through the hallways of the um, airport from one connecting flight to another and we just pray that, that you would send the right people to point her right in the right direction so she can get there safely and efficiently and effectively. Uh, we pray for her time with the missionaries that she'll be staying with, that she will be a blessing to them. We all know that. Um, we pray that they would be just equally as much of a blessing to her, that personalities would just mesh well, um, and that would just be a great time of learning and growing and serving. And, Father, we just thank you for her heart that her last request there was that... Um, she would have the eyes to see, to see your work in her life and your work in Ecuador. And um, I just thank you for her servant heart. And I, I pray you would reveal just what you want to reveal to her. And we trust that she will grow just like you would want her to grow. And we just thank you so much for this opportunity that we can be part of it. And um, we thank you for her family. And we just pray for her for all their needs right now, that you would meet those and they would feel your presence. Amen. And thank you so much, Jess. Rachel, we love you, and you have our deep, deep sympathy. Um, you, we uh, can imagine what you're going through, but we are so filled with joy about what you will experience, and uh, we entrust you to this ministry. I'm going to ask the uh, ushers if they'll come at this time, and we'll worship the Lord with our gifts. So, gentlemen... Could you please come? I'm ask Ty if he would ask God to bless the offering. Ty? Amen. Thank you. Once you've added your offering, if you're willing and able, let's just stand together and worship God.
morning, everybody. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come together to be reminded of your goodness. Of your supernatural mercy. That you, Jesus, you stepped into the gap on our behalf. That as Steve said, we can celebrate. We can celebrate not only lives gone by, but we can celebrate things even today. We celebrate the opportunity of people willing to work on behalf of, of your kingdom. As Jess prayed, I thank you for Rach, and I just ask you to just bless this uh, experience for her. As it, it, is, it is obvious to anybody that, that you have steered her in this, in this way. Yes, Lord. I pray that you be with Louis as he goes to Mahaffey this week. I pray that he would have the... the uh, the words and the courage to, to help the, those kids at camp this week. We can celebrate the positive news that we hear with his recovery. I pray that you would continue to restore him and strengthen him each day. We can celebrate your mercy and grace in the life of Diane. And even now as you are upholding her family, your word tells us that there's a time to weep and there's a time to dance. So I pray, God, that as they reflect back on her life, they would see it through the lens of, of mercy and grace through Christ. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it is true, that it is solid. That it's not like a piece of Swiss cheese with holes all through it. That we can trust it. That you do not lead us astray. You do not leave us alone. You don't forget about us. Instead, God, you step right into our lives. I pray that the eyes of our hearts would see that. And that we would see that with, with hearts that, that hunger for you. You tell us that when we hunger and thirst for you, we will be filled. Thank you, Jesus. Make us hungry, Lord. Mm -hmm. I pray that you be with Steve now as he teaches us. I thank you for the way that his mind works, the way that he sees things the way that your spirit guides him. Bless him now as we, bless us. In your name we pray, amen. amen. Amen, thank you, Josh. At this time, the children are dismissed. If they'd like to go to Children's Church, they're welcome to do so. We're glad that you're with us and glad you can go and enjoy uh, the Children's Church service, children's worship as they call it. So Josh, thank God for the way my mind works. I don't think anyone has ever said that sentence before. Yeah, I don't know if you remember Ken Davis. He was a Christian comedian, and he said that when God made him, you know, God, he imagines God at his workshop, you know, oh, I'll put a little bit of musical ability into this person, that person I'll put a little math mathematical genius. And Davis said, when God made me, he said, give me that can up there, Michael. And Michael, the archangel, said, this one? No, the one behind it. That one? No, this one. Oh, Twisted mind. Let's give him that one. Yeah, and so Ken Davis and I are kind of on the same page there. Hey, if you would like to, I would encourage you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 31 through 34. There is a Bible app event for this message, and that makes you able to grab the Word of God quite easily. Luke chapter 4, verse 34. This is not one of the Bible story messages. It's more of a topical sermon. And it is, about, oh, listen, my phone is beeping there. Yeah, there's my son wants to talk to me. Let me just mute my phone here for a minute. That'll work. Good morning. My name's Steve Shields, and I'm ready to go again. So here we are. We're uh, looking at this message. It's not a topical sermon. It's, I'm sorry, it is a topical sermon. It's not one of the Bible stories. And we're going to look at a passage where Jesus, just by his words, just by his words, does the most amazing thing. And, and I, I think to myself, um, how important are the words of Jesus? And as we talk about this, I really want to give, I want to I get you to give some thought 
to the priority that you give the word of God in your life? Like, how does it compare to your strong desire to see that new Sonic the Hedgehog movie or whatever it is that might be in your mind? How do you prioritize uh, the word, to, word of God? What is your commitment to it? Because words are important. I think you probably know that, that how do you get advice? Almost always you get it through words. How do you find hope when you need hope? Almost always, that's coming through words. How do you bring peace to a chaotic situation you find yourself in? Quite frequently, it's by your words. And how do you make sense of the times in which we live? Most often, it's through words. I'll never forget a sermon on cassette tape that a new couple at my church decades ago gave to me. Uh, and I'm just going to tell you up front, it was just kind of creepy and scary, this sermon was to me. Uh, they'd moved into our community from another state, and they landed here at uh, Kerbinsville Alliance for a short time. And they immediately said, like the first or second week that I, I was talking to them, they said, uh, you guys, you don't take the Bible seriously enough. Now, you got to know, we were meeting three times a week then, and we had Bible teaching like crazy on top of Sunday school classes for all ages. You guys, you guys don't take the Bible seriously enough. You don't respect it well. You don't give it proper attention. I said, what are you talking about? And they said, well, in my last church, and they were, they were that couple, you know, in my last church, in my last church, in my last church. And, and, and they kind of harped on such things. Finally, I said to them, do you happen to have a recording of the worship from your last church? Because I was curious. I wanted to hear it. And they were delighted to give it to me. Now, you got to know. <laughs> you got to know a couple of things. Number one. You got to know this is a couple decades ago, so probably not everything is exactly like I'm telling you. My memory's a little foggy. And the other thing you have to know is that, like, when I see a picture, I always want to color it and make it a little better. So I might embellish this just a little bit. But this is, uh, this is what I remember of that sermon, how it began. The music was over. The pastor got up, and he said words like this. Now we're going to look into the Word of God. No one is to be whispering. There'll be no rustling in your seat. Sit still. Ladies, I don't want you rummaging in your purses for mints or something. No one is going to leave the sanctuary. The doors have been closed and the men are standing there. You are to stay here. And if you need to go to the restroom, wait. This is the word of God and we're going to give it our full attention. Now, if you walked in in the middle of that, I'm quoting somebody else. That's not me talking, right? But I want to say, <laughs> as I listen to that, does that seem a little over the top to you? It seems way over the top to me. I don't like the kind of threatening fear that I hear there. I don't, I don't like the kind of disrespectful demand, and I really don't like the control that's going on there a leader with that kind of control. It just doesn't feel healthy to me. I don't want to be their last church. I felt that was kind of extreme, and I still feel the same way. I do wonder, though. I wonder, when I look around today, at Christian culture at large, from here to Peking, China, as I look at Christian culture at large, I wonder if maybe we've gone all the way over to the other extreme on our viewpoint of Scripture. Is it possible that Christians today have too little respect for the Bible? Could we be in danger of not giving the words of Jesus, for example, the attention that they deserve? Do you, do I, have a proper reverence for God's Word? I kind of fear and this is just my opinion, but I kind of fear that we're in the midst of a long-running trend away from seeing the Bible as being the authority in matters of faith and practice. And I'm not talking about what I'm seeing on social media, because you got to know what you're seeing on social media is the extremes. I'm talking about what I read in journals and in publications, and what I hear people say who are in leadership. 
Well, I know. I know that's what the Bible says, but this is 2022. Hmm. You know, maybe we need to change our thinking on that one item. People are just not going to buy into that, even if the Bible does say it. Hmm. Well, these are very difficult passages. What if we just set them aside and focus on the love? Can we do that? I've heard comments like those from Christian leaders. And it makes me wonder, are we today in danger of losing our respect for God's word? And I would, I would suggest to you that if that were the case, it would be tragic because God's word is essential. It's not just important, it's crucial. It's essential to Christian life. The only way you specifically know the things you know about Jesus is because they're in the word of God. And the only way the people around Jesus really knew who he was and what he was about is because of the words that he spoke to them. And as believers, I feel like our familiarity with the word of God can kind of make us or break us, especially when tragedy comes into our life. I've spoken a couple times in the past year about this gentleman, a fellow named Billy Graham. In the last century, he inspired the world with the gospel of Christ. And that's because Graham knew and believed that God's word has authority. It is authoritative in our life. It is what draws us to Christ. It is what connects us to Christ as the Holy Spirit works to bring God's word alive in our hearts. You may or may not know this story about Billy Graham. When he was starting out, when he was young, he was friends with another evangelist. That evangelist's name was Charles Templeton. Just to satisfy my curiosity, does anyone know who Charles Templeton was? Look around, look how many hands are up. Yeah, the number you're looking for is zero, okay? Charles Templeton was a contemporary and a friend of Billy Graham when they were starting out. And the people that knew them both say, if I had to put my money on either of those boys, it would have been Templeton. He was a much better speaker and much more persuasive than was Billy Graham. Everyone thought Templeton is the young evangelist that will turn the world around and set it on fire for Christ. But that didn't happen. You don't even know his name. How did that not happen? Templeton, if you look at his life, he actually ends up leaving the Christian faith. He actually ends up becoming an atheist. Shortly before Templeton died, he wrote a book, such a sad title, Farewell to God. I didn't read the book, but I've read excerpts from it. I want to share one of those excerpts with you today. It's really where he's writing about a pivotal conversation that he had with a young Billy Graham when he was a young Charles Templeton. And I want you to listen to Templeton's words. I'm gonna read the first part and then I'll put the latter part on the screen. This is Templeton speaking. I've edited it just for sake of focus and for time. Listen to what he says. All our differences came to a head in a discussion which better than anything I know explains Billy Graham and his phenomenal success as an evangelist. In the course of our conversation, I said, but Billy, it's simply not possible any longer to believe the biblical account. I don't accept that, Billy said. I've discovered something in my ministry. When I take the Bible literally, when I proclaim it as a word of God, my preaching has power. When I stand on a platform and say, God says, or the Bible says, the Holy Spirit uses me. There are results. Wiser men than you and I have been arguing questions like this for centuries. I don't have the time or the intellect to examine all sides of the theological dispute. So I've decided once for all to stop questioning and accept the Bible as God's word. And Templeton says that was the difference. That was the difference. His respect for the Bible made Graham effective. And his disrespect for the Bible leaves Templeton unknown. The Word of God is authoritative. And that is why we study it carefully. We never study the Bible so that we can use it. You know, oh, if I knew the Bible, maybe I can use that on my wife and get her to submit. Get out of here. 
get out of town, right? Yeah. We don't study it so we can use it. It's not for us to use. We don't study it so that we can impress our friends and fool our enemies. We study it so that it can transform our hearts. We don't study it so we can win arguments. I met a young man one time. He said, Pastor, would you teach a book, book on, I mean, a class on theology? I said, I would love to do that. He said, good, I got some arguments I need to win. I'm not going to do that. That's not why we study the word of God. We study it so when it comes to those arguments, so we can help others, not beat them, not win. We give the Bible our attention. So, hey, what do you say we do that right now? Let's read those verses I ask you to open your Bible to. It's in Luke chapter 4, starting at 31. It's talking about Jesus. It says, Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had, do you listen to that sentence again, his words had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. And then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What words these are! What authority and power he gives orders. With authority and power he gives orders to impure spirits, and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering with a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of people shouting, you are the son of God, but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew he was the Messiah. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving, but he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because this is why I was sent. And he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea. Now, as I read that passage this week, and I kind of looked long and hard at it, the thing that stood out to me, and there's a lot of things that could stand out to you from this passage, but the thing that stood out to me was how all the dramatic things, all the amazing things that happened in this passage were from the Word of God. Jesus just said the words, and it happened. And that kind of helps me understand why we spend time in God's Word. To begin with, his word is truth. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays what we call the high priestly prayer. It's a high prayer of intercession for his followers, even for us who will follow later. And in verse 17 of that chapter, Jesus says to the Father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Take a look at verses 31 and 32 again. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people, and they were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. This kind of response of the people, their amazement at Jesus' teaching, that became a constant annoyance to the religious leadership. The Pharisees didn't like him receiving the attention that they were accustomed to receiving. And this is what made it really bad. Those Pharisees... They were scholars. Sadducees, they were brilliant men. Even the scribes, buddy, they knew their stuff. And yet, and yet, they just couldn't argue with Jesus. Least of all, they could not argue with him successfully. And they were brilliant. And yet Jesus always won. I mean, even when Jesus is on trial, it's not him who comes out to be the liar. When they come to arrest him, Matthew tells us in Matthew 26, 55, that Jesus said to them, hey, am I leading a rebellion that you come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you did not arrest me. Why not? <laughs> because he was telling the truth. Thy word is truth. You would be hard-pressed hard 
you would be hard-pressed to find a place in the Bible where Jesus lost an argument. And it wasn't because he was president of the junior high debate team. <laughs> it was because he was right and because he spoke the truth. And we give our attention to Jesus' words, to God's word, because they're true. And likewise, we give attention to them because they're relevant. That's what I kind of read when I hear verse 32 where it says, they were amazed at his teaching because it had authority. You see, Jesus' teaching is relevant because it holds real authority over the real events of our real everyday lives. And that makes it relevant. Authority that brings transformation to lives. I am not saying that unless something is relevant, it has no authority. I am saying that whatever carries authority is relevant automatically. Automatically. And so the word of God is authoritative. So it's relevant automatically. And it can change your life. Let me give you a couple illustrations, a couple examples, right out of the word of God. Just sit back and enjoy these. <laughs> Are you struggling with any worry right now? Well, the Bible says, do not be anxious about anything, but in every th situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God's word is relevant. It's authoritative. Are you dealing with any fear right now? Are you fretting with fear? Well, the Bible says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God's word is relevant. It's authoritative. Ever feel defeated? Like you just can't, you just can't win? Well, the Bible says, I have told you these things so that in me you might have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. The Bible is relevant. It is authoritative. You're dealing with anger? Any road rage? <laughs> Any just huge frustration? The Bible says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God's word is relevant. It's authoritative. Are you weighed down by sorrow? Do you feel that weight of sorrow? The Bible says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. My God, your word is relevant, and it's authoritative. And so we give it our attention. So number one, we spend time in God's word because it's truth. Number two, we spend time in God's word because it's relevant. Number three, we look to Christ's words because they bring freedom. Did you notice in verse 35 what it was that freed the man from the demon? I mean, look at verse 35 again. It says, be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. And then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. What was it that brought that freedom? The words of Christ. Christ's words. By the way, this is just a little bit of a rabbit trail, <laughs> but I'm going to quote Vance ha Havner that a lot of us happen to live down at the end of those rabbit trails, okay? The NIV here reads uh, differently than other translations. And by the way, I'm not a translation bashers. I feel we are blessed beyond measure by the myriad of translations we have. I love the NIV. But I think it's good to take a look at the actual words used here. The NIV reads, in a synagogue, there was a man, and here's the phrase, a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice. Okay, you got that? 
a man possessed by a demon, as though the demon owned him. If I possess a pocket knife, I own it. A man possessed by a demon. Now, the NIV probably uses that phrase because we use that phrasing all the time. Every horror movie I've ever seen, it has those kinds of spirits and it uses that language. The NIV is probably accommodating the editors or probably choosing that phrase to accommodate our understanding. But other translations, and listen to the list, listen to the number of them. They say it differently than does the NIV. The English Standard Version. The footnote in the New American Standard Version. The King James Version. The New King James Version. The Lexham English Bible. Young's Literal Translation. They all say it differently than does the NIV. They don't indicate that the demon possessed the man. They indicate that the man possessed a demon. I'll put it on the screen. Look at the NIV once more. In a synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice. Now take a look at the English Standard Version. In a synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon, and he cried out in a loud voice. Do you understand the difference there? <laughs> Do you understand the difference there? Have you ever felt like you have an angel on one shoulder and a devil on the other, <laughs> like in the cartoons? that imagery might, be, might not be so far from wrong. And we kind of have that figure of speech or that line that we say, well, we all have our demons. Perhaps. Perhaps many of us have had demons or at least places in our lives where we have given the devil a foothold. That's a biblical phrase, you know. Yeah. How do you get free from that? with Jesus' words, with the truth. And that kind of makes sense that it is the truth, it's Jesus' words that overcome the enemy because, you know, Jesus refers to Satan as the father of lies. And then in 831 of John, it says to the Jews who believed in him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you really are my disciples, then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free feel like you're stuck? Feel like you've given the enemy of your soul a foothold? Feel like you're under attack? Jesus' words are truth. They bring freedom. We love the word of God because it sets us free. And we love these words of Christ because they bring healing. You, you may have noticed what's happening in, uh, with Peter's mother-in-law here. She's sick. And in verse 39, they have asked Jesus, would you please help her? I mean, he's just healed. Can you help her? And so verse 39 says, he bent over her and rebuked the fever and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. And you know, Jesus has been at the synagogue. He's been doing ministry and he comes in. It's probably toward the close of the day. And you know that in the evening, that's when a fever begins to spike. That's been my experience anyway. And so here when the fever is at its fever pitch, see what I did there? When the fever is really cooking, wow, that one worked too, didn't it? When it's really on its game, Jesus just comes in and rebukes it. And it's gone with a word of rebuke. When Matthew recalls this, he tells us that this physical healing is actually a fulfillment of Isaiah 53. Matthew says in 817, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. Jesus' words bring healing because he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds were healed. And so you see Jesus, the word of God, bringing healing by his wounds in his word. We give attention to the word of God because it brings healing, spiritual healing, emotional healing, even physical healing. And all of this tells us, like, kind of when the story wraps up toward the end, that this is for everyone. His word, his words are for everyone. I say that because these people in this story in Capernaum, they want what anybody wants. Jesus, I want you to stay with me. I would like, we'll build you a house, buddy. 
You can live right in town here. I want you to myself. And Jesus replies to them in verse 43, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns because that is why I was sent. His words are for everyone. Everyone. You know, you and I, we have struck it rich. I hold in my hand a device that I guarantee you I could pull up 20 different, 20 different translations of the Bible, all in English. I'm sitting in Ulyanovsk, Russia, in the center of, of, of Russia, where, where uh, Lenin was born. And a translator is like, I, I, I'm looking because we're going to preach, and he's looking, and he says with his paper Bible, oh, I can't find this. He's not as acquainted with it as he might be. And I said, why don't you use the Bible app? He said, well, what do you mean? I said, you got internet? Yeah. Well, I feel sure the Bible app has a Russian translation, and it did. You and I are so, we have struck it so rich. We have found the words. We have found the Savior. Most of us have personally come to a time when we said, I need you, Jesus. Forgive my sins. I want to follow you. I turn away from darkness. I will follow after the light. We have struck a wrench. We found truth in a world that doesn't know fact from fiction. We have found relevant, authoritative teaching in a world of compromise and guessing. We have found freedom in a world that is in so much bondage it makes you want to weep. And we have found healing through his wounds, through his words. Here's my question. How selfish, how selfish would I have to be to want to keep that to myself? <laughs> In order that we might share, what does they say? I'm going to share the love, you know. In order that we might share the love, we study God's word. We study it so that we might know it and be able to share it well. We open it every Sunday. One of the craziest questions someone ever asked me is when I was first starting to preach, a visitor came and they said, why do you use the Bible every week? <laughs> I just told you why. That's what the last 25 minutes were, right? We use it in our small groups. You know, we have small groups that look to the Bible to grow in our faith. If I wanted a small group that didn't do that, why not join a sportsman's club or something? We, we, we use it in our homes. Man, I hope you open the Bible regularly. <laughs> There's so much there. One of the most sobering moments I ever had in my life Something ever hit you like a ton of bricks, just a reality? Like, whoa! I, I'd just begun preaching, and I'd spent four years, I'd spent a little more than four years getting my degree. <laughs> and, and, and I'd been in the, the, those four years in, in a, an environment where everybody read their Bible every day because there might be a test on Monday. You know, you're taking New Testament literature, you're studying the book of James, or you're reading the Pauline epistles, or you're doing the Gospels, and, or you're doing Genesis. You're reading your Bible every day. And I came out of that environment into a church environment, and I can remember one day I was preaching, I happened to look at a guy who, who I, I, I just, my heart went out to him, and I thought, this is the thought that came to my mind. I'd blame it on the Holy Spirit, but I don't think he would have done this to me at that moment. I looked at him and I thought, this is the only Bible that guy's going to get this week. I got 25, 35 minutes. This is all he's getting this week. Let me tell you something. I don't feel like I'm that great a preacher right now, but I'll tell you, I was a terrible preacher then. Spiritually, that guy must have been starved, right? I hope you get more than this 40 minutes that we give on Sunday. I hope that you open your Bible every week so that you know it, so that you can share this rich, rich word of God with others. We study God's word so we can share it well. We study God's word so that we can live well. We obey it so that we live well. We find it authoritative. 
Yeah, it has a whole lot to say about how you behave in the workplace. Did you know that? Yeah, you know that. So we apply that. Jesus talks a lot about our relationship with the Father and our relationship with others. And so we receive Jesus' instruction and we apply that in our lives. The Bible says a lot about how we treat our neighbor. And so we apply it. We don't consider the word of God as being just some suggestions. You know, the Ten Commandments. A lot of times we act like those are the ten suggestions, <laughs> you know? We, we consider his word to be relevant and authoritative. So we study it. We work to obey it. And <laughs> because we know there are other towns to which I must go, Jesus says, we study God's word so that we can share it specifically with others. So others can come and see. We invite them to interact with God's word. We support international workers who travel far away with our prayers, with our giving. We pray for Rachel as she goes. We, we've given money, some of you have, to send her on her way because we want others to find what we have, what we have found because we are so rich. What must I be like if I don't care to share that with others? We, we behave as fishers of men. And if you weren't here last week, go listen to that on the podcast. We honor the word of God because words, they are important. I mean, how do you get good advice? Through words. How do you find hope? Through someone's words. How do you bring peace to a chaotic situation? Generally through your words. How do you make sense of the world in which we live? Most often, through words. And the best place to get all of these and more is in Christ, the living word, who speaks to us through his scripture. I want to pray that each of us would be doing that on a level that is beneficial to us, glorifying to God and helpful to the kingdom. So if you're comfortable doing so, let's stand together and we'll pray. Let's bow our hearts together. Lord Jesus, uh, we are thankful for your word. I would pray that we would make it our priority to study it, to load up the YouVersion Bible app and subscribe to a plan, to grab a daily bread and begin to read it on the way out, to pick one of the Gospels like John, read it through chapter at a time. Whatever it is, may we study your word and cooperate with others who study it. I pray that we would obey it. Your word isn't out there to spoil our fun. It is out there to make our lives worth living. And so help us to consider that which it says and act on it so that we live well. And help us to share it so that others can come and see, <laughs> so that they can receive what we have received. I pray for all of us here today that as we think about where we stand with you, we would have an awareness of your great love for us that you showed us in Christ Jesus. And that each of our hearts would be turned toward you saying, I trust you, Jesus. I trust you to have paid for my sins, to give me eternal life. I will follow you. And as we have done that, may we grow in the richness of your word that you provide. For this is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.
and receive this benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you.